May we pray? Almighty God, may we sense the presence of your Holy Spirit this morning as we have gathered to worship you. May your Spirit guide us to do your will throughout this day, this week, and beyond. May your Spirit grant us courage and humility in the years to come. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please join me in the call to worship. God comes into a world filled with uncertainties and darkness. God seeks to heal and restore our world. God embraces the wounded and broken. God knocks down the walls of division and strife. God is the candle shining in the darkness of our days. God is the light of our lives. God is the one who makes all things new. Let's join together now as we sing hymn number 647. We have come to join in worship. Hymn, hymn number 647. Let's stand together as we sing. Good morning. How's everybody doing today? Good. I'm glad to hear that. It's a good crowd this morning. Weather's been good. Spring's almost here. One week till Palm Sundays. It's going to rain. Oh, I didn't even know that. <laughs> oh, well, it'll be spring soon enough. And, um, and I apologize in advance. No candy today because a week from today's the egg hunt. And I know y'all want to save your candy appetite for that. <laughs> I've got an honest question for you this morning. Anyone know what prayer is? What is prayer? It's where man is supposed to be. Okay. Anybody else? All right, yeah. I mean, and prayer can have something to do with feeling better, that's for sure. Um, and I like your answer, too. Can you say that again for me? 
like you're speaking to God, you're talking to God. Exactly, exactly. What are some times when y'all pray? What are some times when we like to pray? Who's got what? Where? Oh, at supper? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a great time. I mean, it's nice to say grace before your meals. When it rains, sometimes we can pray for sunny weather. Right before you go to bed, that's a great time to pray, too. That's true, before you drive some places, and we do that a lot when we go on trips as a church. Everybody gets together and prays before we go for a safe trip. And Yep. And um, what are some things we pray for? You said one when we pray for good weather, but what are some other things we always pray for? Fantastic. We can pray for, for people we don't know, but they're hurt because we want to pray for healing. And that's actually ex almost exactly what the sermon is going to be about today. So that was great. Anything else? Pray for people who are sick. Exactly. That fits. Right. We can pray for all kinds of people. Oh, that's a fantastic thing to do. That's what um, Jesus told us to do that. Jesus told us if somebody's hungry to give them food. If you see a car crash, that's a good time to pray for people. That's always sad to see, and you always pray no one got hurt. Well, yeah, you can't get put in jail for that. <laughs> All right, so y'all have done a fantastic job of things to pray for. That would be a great time to pray, too. Um, so there's, like, there's lots of good times to pray, lots of good things to pray for. Um, and Jesus even gave us kind of a great prayer to, like, learn from. And because the disciples wanted to know, how do we pray? What's a good way to pray? And Jesus taught them something. Does anybody know what that's called, the special prayer that Jesus taught them? The whose prayer? Lord's Prayer, all right. Um, but I've got a copy of that, and my challenge is to y'all is to maybe go home if you don't already know it and start working on memorizing it. That's what we're doing at home, and it's, it's, it's fun. It doesn't take that long, and it's a great prayer to memorize. So I've got a copy of that for everybody today. But let's pray right now, okay? Dear God, thank you for spring. Thank you that next week is Palm Sunday. Please be with people who are sick. Please forgive us when we mess up. Help us to be good to each other. In Jesus' name, amen.
Our New Testament reading for this day is taken from the Apostle of James in the fifth chapter, verses 13 through 20. Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up, and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being like us, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth yielded its harvest. My brothers and sisters, if any one among you wanders from the truth and is brought back by another, you should know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save the sinner's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? What a tremendous privilege it is, O oh Lord, to bow our heads and to humble our hearts and to speak to the Almighty, to call on the names of our Lord and to know that you hear us. Whether we speak with words or whether we simply are silent in pre your presence, O oh God, you hear and respect what we have to say. You listen to our every request. And Lord, I pray that in our prayers that we will show you the same respect. That we will listen and honor the things that you tell us in prayer. And the questions that you ask of us when we pray. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of speaking and listening to you. Our creator, our sustainer. And the one who redeems our very life. The one who gives us the healing that we so desperately need in life. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be a prayerful people. But a people who not only believe in a practice, but live prayerful lives. Lives in constant conversation and communion with you. Recognizing your work in our world. And joining you when we are led, and sent. Thank you, Lord, for this, your church, and I pray that you would use us to share and to proclaim the message of Jesus Christ through prayerful lives, that we would be the body of Christ in this world, on, in this place, providing healing and hope for those who are sick of body or of heart, or of mind, or of spirit, knowing that your healing words touches our hearts and enables us to be made new each and every day. Lord, help us to be your healing people, for you are a healing God. It's in the name of the one who heals us that we pray. Amen. Our offertory hymn this morning is number 447, Because He Lives. Hymn number 447. Let's stand together as we sing.
Pray with me, please. Oh, Lord, we enter into your gates with thanksgiving and into your house with praise. We thank you for the opportunity we've had of study and worship today. We thank you for the privilege of calling you our Savior. And Lord, as we continue into the Lent season, we pray that we will continue preparing our hearts and our minds, knowing that you're alive, you're alive today. And we know, Lord, that it takes resources to spread your word. And we pray that we will not be deniers of your resurrection. We will not be doubters that you're alive today. But help us be bold in our witness and stand firm in our conviction as we spread the word to those who do not know you as their personal Savior. We pray that we will return unto you a portion of that which you have blessed us with, that we may be able to spread the word. Continue to use us for your honor and for your glory in our daily walk with you. These blessings we ask in the name of our precious Savior. Amen. <laughs> God of healing, we bring our prayers to you. Our prayers at this moment are not those we prayed yesterday, nor are they the ones we will pray tomorrow. For we are a little farther along than we were yesterday, and we are not where we will be tomorrow. Some of us are a bit stronger, some a little more fragile. In our strongest moments and in our weakest ones, your spirit heals us in ways we do not understand. Remind the sad and lonely, you do not despise a broken heart, but welcome its tears. Remind the fearful ones that fragile people shall yet dream dreams. Remind those aching for others that one day the lame shall leap for joy, the blind shall see, and the deaf shall hear. What can we believe, O oh God? That the touch of your mercy will ease our pain? and your spirit will help us care, 
that the strength of your healing comes in the midst of our deepest heartaches, in our shimmering joys, and in our crushing sorrows. God, whose steadfastness outshines the sun, we lean on your steady love. Those are beautiful words written by Sharlon Sledge. And let me take just a moment to give you some indication of how those words have been made true through the life of First Baptist Church just in the past few days. It's been a fairly ordinary week in the life of our church, but it's also been an extraordinary week in the life of our church. I wish I had the exact numbers, but one exact number that I have is 300. That's the number of bandanas that our women on mission folded and prepared through Operation Bandana. Those bandanas will now go to uh, men and women in the military all over the world, just as a gesture of kindness and of assurance of prayer. Some healing going on there. And then on Wednesday, our youth, as they do every Wednesday night, go to our community on mission, sharing encouragement in nursing homes and in other places, just offering a smile, a presence, and being the body of Christ. And then also, Friday night and Saturday, several of our older youth went to Fayetteville and joined with three other youth groups in that community and experienced a plunge into poverty. It was an educational experience for them to understand what it's like to live homeless and to live by the mercies of those within the church and other places. And then yesterday, nine of our men of our church gathered together to build a handicap ramp for a person in our county who's in desperate need. Those are just some of the things that have happened in the life of our church over the past few days. And in many ways, they correspond quite well to the word for this day, that of healing. We did not heal any physical bodies, but perhaps we have provided some spiritual healing in meaningful ways. Will you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for your presence in this place and in these hearts. And now, O oh Lord, we open our minds and spirits to you more fully and pray that your spirit will indeed instruct and guide, comfort and challenge us to be the body of Christ to one another and to our community and world. Breathe through these words, O oh Lord, into us. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. I first met Scarlett about three years ago. She was about five hours old when I met her. Scarlett is the daughter of a pastor friend of mine here, here in Robeson County. And when Scarlett was born, there was a little problem. She was having some difficulty breathing. So my pastor friend, Brad, called me and said, David, would you mind coming to the hospital for a few minutes? I immediately got in the car and drove up to, to Cape Fear Hospital and, and met Scarlett. I prayed for her and prayed with my friend. And I can tell you now that Scarlett is a beautiful, perfectly healthy little three-year-old who has become something of an intercessor. Brad told me this story just this week. He said a, a few days ago, maybe a week or so ago, he developed a virus and started to have a sore throat. None of us likes to have a sore throat, but especially preachers, that's just not convenient. And, and Brad was staying at home one day, not feeling well with this sore throat, and Scarlett saw that his, her daddy was not feeling good, and so she wanted to do something for it. And she said, Daddy, I want to help you, and I'm going to do for you what you always do for me. When I get a cold or when I fall and I scrape my elbow or my knee, you always kiss it to make it better. And so Scarlett comes right over and gives Brad a good old kiss right there on the throat. And then she stepped back and says, do you feel better now? Well, it must have been a real 
sore throat because Brad said, well, thank you, honey, but, but no, I don't really feel much better. Okay, she said, I'm not done yet. Kissing it didn't make it better, so I'm going to pray for you. And she pulls her hands together, she bows her head, and she closes her eyes, and she prays a beautiful prayer. Dear God, my daddy doesn't feel good today. Would you please help him feel better? How about now? Do you feel better now? I don't know if the Apostle James would consider Scarlet to be an elder of the church. But I, I do believe that James would certainly appreciate Scarlet's effort. That James would, would bless Scarlet for being one who tried to pray for her dad, who did pray for her dad. And I believe James would be one who would certainly affirm the effort of any person praying for the sick, of entering into the suffering of another and trying to alleviate some of the pain that they might feel if they are ill. And I also believe James would commend us as a church. We probably could grow our prayer ministry significantly, but we are a praying people. We understand in the value of prayer and the importance of prayer. On a weekly basis, we inform one another of different needs within our families and within our own selves. And we ask one another to pray for one another, and it is our privilege to do so. And in doing so, we fulfill some of what Trevor Hudson says in the way of transforming discipleship. We have been walking this way of transforming discipleship with Trevor Hudson through this Lenten season. And today we come to a point where he and teaches us or encourages us to experience the God who heals. And he tells us that there are three things or, or three lampposts, if you will, that help us understand how we can experience the God who heals. First, we need to be vulnerable, he says. We need to admit the fact that we are not all powerful, that none of us are perfect, that we all have our weaknesses in some place, and we best be honest with those weaknesses and confront them and let other people know that we are all weak. We need to be vulnerable. Second, he says, we need to enter into the mystery of prayer. We do that. We've done that just today in praying for one another. And then third, he says, we need to understand that healing is bound tightly to confession. We must confess our sins to God, but we must also confess our sins to one another. We must ask for forgiveness from those we have harmed, and we must ask for forgiveness for those we have refused to help. These are helpful points that Hudson makes in his book. And I believe that we are familiar with them, at least. These are some of the things that we do. We indeed acknowledge that we're not perfect. We do pray for one another, and we do understand how important confession is. We're pleased to pray for healing and pleased to pray for one another. But have you ever paused for even the briefest moment when it comes to praying for one another and ask yourself, what is it exactly that I want God to do? What are we asking God to do when we pray for one another? Now, earlier I read James chapter 5, verses 13 through 20. And the, the key verse there for us today is verse 15. In the translation that I read from, the New Revised Standard Version, it says, the prayer of faith will save the sick. That's taken verbatim from the King James. The King James says it exactly the same way. The prayer of faith will save the sick. Now that's a good understanding. That's a good way to hear that verse. But if you are reading from the New International Version, which is the most popular version of the Bible, you read it a different way. The NIV says that the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. They will be made well. 
And if you're reading from the New American Standard, which is typically the most uh, accurate to the actual languages, you read that the prayer of faith will restore the one who is sick. Now, reading different translations of the Bible is an excellent way of studying the Scripture. Because by doing so, you get different ideas and thoughts about what the actual words mean. But every once in a while, when we come to a passage such as James chapter 5, verse 15, and you see these translations have different words and different ideas interpreted from the text... Well, sometimes it, it's almost an indication that the translators aren't completely sure as to what the text is saying. And I wonder if James 5.15 is one of those times. Maybe we don't know exactly what it is that the prayer of faith is supposed to do. I wonder this, not because of any problem with words and with languages or linguistics or anything of that sort, but I wonder this because of simple reality. Our challenge here is not a linguistic one, but rather it is a challenge from reality. Regardless of the translation you read, the passage says that the Lord will respond favorably to the prayer of faith. But how many of us have prayed for people, have prayed for our husbands, our wives, our parents, our sons and our daughters. How many of us have prayed fervently for those who were ill or those who were infirmed? And for some reason, the Lord did not physically save or make well or restore them. If I asked for a show of hands, I'm sure I would see every hand go up. For we have all prayed for individuals and prayed fervently, prayed prayed the prayer of faith. And yet for some reason, the Lord did not physically save or make well or restore. We have a problem with this text. And the problem is the fact that we live in a fallen world. We're all sinners. And while that may mean many things, part of it means the fact that we are susceptible to to disease. Illnesses happen to us. Disease plagues our bodies. We get sick at times. And we lose loved ones. I mean no disrespect to James whatsoever, but the simple truth of life is the fact that prayer doesn't always heal our bodies. James makes it sound so so obvious. If you're sick, call on the elders of the church and they'll come pray for you and they'll anoint you with oil and then you will be made well. But that's just not always the case, is it? And that's the bad news, friends. That's the bad news. We live in a fallen world where prayer doesn't always heal our bodies. That's the bad news, but there is good news. And the good news, thanks be to God, is the fact that there is more to life than just good physical health. There is more to life than being able to see with 20-20 vision or being able to hear a pin drop in a crowded room. There is more to life than being able to run and jump like a An energetic five-year-old. There's more to life than just good physical health. Norman Wurzba reminded me of this truth this week. In an article written in Christian Century magazine, that's actually an excerpt from his new book called Way of Love. Wurzba is a professor at Duke Divinity School now, and he teaches theology and ecology there. And in his new book, he talks about how health is not just a matter of your physical condition, but rather health is also a matter of your spiritual heart. That as your spiritual heart is healthy and strong, that is more an indication of health than your pulse or your blood pressure or any physical part of your life. 
health, he says, is about the heart. And he had this theological idea and an understanding that as we are strong of heart, we are more connected to people. But as we are weak of spiritual heart, we tend to withdraw and pull away from folks. And he believed that, but he says he never really understood it until he met Mark Eddy. At the point when he met Mark Eddy in his life, he was teaching at Georgetown College in Georgetown, Kentucky. And Mark Eddy joined the faculty there, I assume in the psychiatry or psychology department. Mark Eddy came and he and Norman became good friends very quickly. Norman, or excuse me, Mark came from a clinical therapy practice. He had spent most of his career taking care of folks and living the last several years in a private hell. He was very tired of his practice, very tired of his life. His family was the only group of people that he had any real affection towards. No one really gave him any time, and, and his patients seemed to be so demanding and yet not responsive to his treatment. Mark confessed later on that he really didn't like life at all. He dreaded getting up every morning. He had no one to connect to. He had no joy in his life whatsoever. At one point he saw a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist was putting him on some medications and that was beginning to help. But then this opportunity to leave his practice and start teaching college students came along and Mark believed that it was an answer to prayer that, that maybe God was taking care of him after all. And so Mark took this opportunity to start teaching and was so excited about the opportunity but about a month after he started his first semester he developed this cough. It became so severe that he went to the doctor, and the doctor ran the tests. And then the doctor said, I'm sorry, it's bad news. You have late stage cancer. And you're not going to be around much longer. The opportunity to teach just seemed like a, a, a grace to Mark. That God had heard his prayers and was responding. And, but now it seems as though God was just playing a cruel trick on him in all that time. But that, at the moment of his greatest desperation, that is when the miracle started to happen. The miracle was that the church stepped up. The church that Mark had just started going to, had only been in that church about a month or so, they stepped up. When they got the news that Mark was sick, they realized some things needed to happen. First of all, someone was going to need to volunteer to drive Mark to his hospital visits because they're new to the community. They don't know anyone, and Mark's wife needed to continue to work. And they also saw those two young teenage boys and all the emotions that they were going to be experiencing. Someone was going to have to love on them and help those boys navigate their grief. The church provided all of that and then gave gifts of food and of money and of gift cards. They just loved on the Eddie family to the best of their ability. And I would love to tell you that everything happened just beautifully and, and Mark was cured and he is living well today, but that's not the case. Mark died from his cancer. But the story does end well. A month or so before Mark's death, he stood before that congregation of of other Christians, that congregation at Faith Baptist Church in Georgetown, Kentucky. And he laid his life out to them. He was willing, Hudson, to be vulnerable to them. And he said, you know, a year ago my life was awful. I hated life. I hated my practice. I hated my work. I loved my family. But that was it. And I'd begun to, to even think that God didn't care at all about me. And I was so filled with anger and with desperation. 
But then I came to this community and started to teach. But then I get the word of cancer. But then you, the church, you stepped up. You reached out to me. You didn't know me at all, but you reached out and you touched me. It was almost as if I was being flooded with prayers and with food and with assurance. It was almost as if God had a thousand arms, he said, and they were reaching around me and drawing me into God. Over these past few weeks, I have been able to experience and see the kingdom of God, Mark said to that church. Now, I don't know what James would say about Mark's story. The elders of the church went to pray for Mark, and he didn't get any better. So I don't know what James would say. But friends, I know a lot of people in this world who have healthy bodies, who have strong minds, who have blood running through their veins, I know a lot of people who are very healthy but are nowhere near as saved or well or restored as Mark was on the day that he died. His body was consumed by cancer, but his spiritual heart was never stronger than it was on the day of his death. Now, please understand, we need to pray for good health. We need to pray that God will give us strong bodies and sharp minds. We need to pray for cures. We need to pray for protection and recovery from illness and from disease. The Psalms tell us to delight ourselves in the Lord and he will give us the desires of our heart. Well, the desire of my heart is to have a strong and healthy body. But friends, we must remember that in the end and throughout the end, we are spiritual beings. These bodies that we have are temporary, temporary homes for eternal beings. The truth is, if our hearts are strong, then our health doesn't matter so much. If they are weak, then anything can devastate us. But if our hearts are strong, we can face any disease. We can even face death. We can face it the way that Mark Eddy faced it. And we can face it the way that A fellow that Trevor Hudson talks of faced it as well. This is actually a story from Tony Campolo that Hudson tells. Campolo is a favorite Baptist preacher who lives in Philadelphia, but he tells the story of Campolo preaching up in the Northwest on one occasion. Don't know the the gist of his sermon or his message, but at the end of the day, he, he offers this invitation. He says, if any of you would like to uh, stay after the service and for me to pray for you, then I would be happy to do so. Well, he concluded the service, and once he did, about 30 people or so stayed after. And true to his word, Dr. Campolo stayed right there as well, and he prayed for each one of those individuals one by one. He he didn't just pray one prayer over everybody, but he allowed each person to come to him individually, and and he listened for a moment, and then he prayed. He stayed a, a couple of hours after that service praying for every one of those people. At the end of the service, he went on back to Philadelphia. About a week later, he gets a phone call. And the lady on the line says, Dr. Campolo, my name is, whatever her name was, and and then said, I was in the service that you preached at last week when you prayed for all those people. Oh, good, good. That was a wonderful service. And she said, yes. She said, my husband was one of the men that you prayed for. Oh, okay, okay. And then she said, he had cancer. 
well, Dr. Campolo said, had cancer? He was thinking maybe, maybe he's been to the doctor and maybe he's gotten a good report. She said, yes, he had cancer, but he died just the other day. Campello's heart just kind of sunk there for a moment. I, I'm, I'm so sorry, he said. She said, no, you don't understand. It, you don't understand what has happened. She said, when we walked into that church, my husband was one of the most angry, bitter men on the face of the earth. He wasn't an old man, and I have no idea how old he was, but we have grandchildren, and when... He was told that he has cancer and that he was going to die. He became very angry because he knew he wasn't going to be able to see his grandchildren. He wanted to watch them grow up and share life with them and take them fishing and hiking and going to ball games and all these things. And, and he realized that all of that wasn't to be. And so he became very angry. He became very mean to me and to our family and to everyone, so much so that no one wanted to be around him. But we went to that church that night, and you prayed for him. And I knew when we walked out of that church, he was a different man. Something happened. I just wanted to let you know that the last four days of our life together were the best four days of our life together. The last four days were the best four days. We laughed together. We prayed together. We even sang the hymns together. And I just wanted to thank you. My husband wasn't cured, but he was healed. He wasn't cured, but he was healed. And friends, isn't that what we want? Yes, it would be nice to be cured. But we want and need to be healed. If you seek a cure and you find it, you can live a few more years. But if you'll make yourself vulnerable, if you'll enter the mystery of prayer, and if you'll confess, You'll find healing, and you'll live forever. Let's pray together. Gracious God, help us to know the difference between a cure and healing. We want both. But while one is very temporary, the healing that we want is eternal. So, Lord, help us to be strong of heart. Touch us so that we might be made whole. We might be made well. That we might be healed. It's in the name of the great physician, the gentle healer, that we pray. Amen. So do you want to be healed? Do you have a place in your heart that needs God's touch? I invite you to come and I will pray with you for the healing that you all need, that we all need. Let's stand together as we sing.